Um, property states don't cover the dower and curtsy law. What are the pro community states? So let's go back and talk about before we get into that. There are separate property and there's community property. Most every state in the United States, when you're married, becomes community property. Anything you acquire during marriage almost always is community property. Now, prior to that, depending on if your state is separate state or a legal state or a community state, there is a uh, rule depending on which state you are. So let's talk about separate states. There are separate states that state that property that you bring to the marriage is yours even after the marriage. So if you owned a car, free and clear, and then you got married and then got divorced, that car would not be part of the marital assets that get split because it was owned before you got married. All right, that's one case of a separate property. Anything that gets willed to you during marriage is also separate property. So if you are married and one spouse receives, let's say, a really nice, let's just go with car, that at the reading of the will, because of their aunt passed away and they left the Rolls Royce to their niece, which is the wife, that family gets, when the, if they were to get divorced, that Rolls Royce would come out of the community property because it was hers, even though they were married, it was willed to her during marriage. And that's how you see heirlooms stay in families. That, you know, like diamond rings or, or houses might be another good example because it was willed to a spouse, even though they are married, which I just told you that most of the time when you're married, it's community. Here's an exception. If something gets willed to one of them, even during marriage, any money that's willed to them is separate property as well. All right, even though it's during marriage. Anything before is yours after or anything you acquired during if it was through a will or something like that. Now, one interesting case, <laughs> I don't know why I know this. If a spouse is awarded through a court pain and suffering for, let's say, negligence from a job and they got hurt and their job's paying them pain and suffering, um, that's actually not community property should they get divorced either, all right? Now, wills or lottery <laughs> is community. You guys heard that, right? Where the guy calls his wife and say, I've hit the lottery, pack your bags. And the wife says, oh, do I pack for warm weather or cold weather? And he says, well, I don't care. Just be gone when I get there, right? <laughs> That's a case of that winnings would be community because they won that while they were married, okay? Now, there are some states that are community property states. There are like only nine of them. Yeah, there are like only nine of these, <clears throat> and we'll get to them a little more in depth later. <clears throat> but basically, that says anything you bring to the marriage becomes both properties. California is being the biggest one that people always talk about. You know, when a couple gets married, no matter what happens, all the money gets joined. So if you're married a day before, or if you're only married a day or two and then get divorced, that other spouse could be worth uh, half, half your property. That's where you start talking about prenups and things like that. So the legal life estate <clears throat> that we talked about was the dower and curtsy right. There is one other called the homestead right. The homestead right is the legal life estate in real estate occupied by the family to protect their primary residence from a judgment against, notice this word here, is unsecured, 
predators. What is unsecured mean? Unsecured means that it's usually just secured by your signature, like a credit card, all right? What would be a secured creditor? A secured creditor would be like a mortgage company because you're using your house as the security. The homestead does not protect you if you use the house as security for the loan, like the mortgage or the real estate taxes. It only protects against unsecured property or unsecured loans. That is the uh, homestead. Now, there are these encumbrances that can encumber. And what does the word encumber mean? Encumber means to tie up or bond or bind or restrict, however you want to look at it. An encumbrance is an interest in property. It's a charge or a claim or a liability that gets attached to that real property by some party because they now have an interest in your uh, real property. Remember what the word interest means. Interest means that there's not possession. So the bank doesn't own your property. They can't walk into your house and sit down, kick their feet up and go, hey man, what's for dinner today? And I'll, you hear people all the time say, one more payment and this baby is mine. Well, maybe in automobiles, and we'll touch on that, but not in houses, all right? I own the property. I just have an interest in that property from some other person. There are two types of encumbrances. An encumbrance is a claim or an interest in your property. Now, the funny thing is, one type of encumbrance is called an encumbrance. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Doesn't that make you mad? It's kind of like New York, New York. Somebody goes, hey, where are you from? They go, oh, I'm from New York. Uh, is that the city or the state? <laughs> um, so one type of an encumbrance is an encumbrance. A lot of times you will hear it called a non-monetary encumbrance because there's no money value that we can put on it as opposed to the second one, which is called a lien, or sometimes you will hear it called a monetary encumbrance because there is a number that we can associate with that and therefore it is a monetary version. It is a charge or a debt against a property or an obligation and using some value to determine the amount of collateral needed. We are not going to discuss liens currently. We are actually going to talk about them inside of their whole separate chapter by themselves. We are going to mainly discuss encumbrances today. Now, there are some private agreements that can be created that will also encumber the people. There's this thing called CCRs, the Conditions, Covenants, and Restrictions, that could be put on there by a builder. I know a housing addition that he's selling lots in, but every house in this is probably 750 and higher. And literally, when you buy a lot in there, the builder will tell you, oh, it's got to be bigger than 5,000 square feet. It all has to be all brick, and the garage has to face the back. Well, why would the builder care? Because what he's trying to do is protect the value of all of the houses in there, because what you don't want is for you to go in and buy a million-dollar home and somebody pull their you know, double wide beside you, and what's that going to do to the value? So what they do is they put CCRs or covenants, conditions, and restrictions to maintain a standard so that when your neighbor builds a house, he's going to build a 5,000 square foot house, all brick too. That's going to help substantiate 
the value of my home, and I'm going to do it for his home, and we're going to do it for that guy's home, and so on and so forth. So we can do it privately, all right? Now, when it comes to easements, there are several different kinds of easements. And easements is the right of another person to use your land for a particular reason. There are several different types of reasons. There is a drawing on page 39 in your book. And I've got to give you a little bit of backstory about this. So let me go over here, take care of this. Remember, here's a 10-acre plot. And what you have is this guy that owns a house, and we'll call it A. On this 10-acre plot is this guy's pond. And he has decided, <clears throat> oh wait, let me add some more stuff here. This is the backstory, just so we all feel better. There's some trees and stuff. And he has decided that he actually wants to make a little extra money. So what he did is he went out and he subdivided this to a survey and he built another house. And he wants to sell that property, but he has to give access because possession is one of the rights. And because of all the forest down here, he can't get through there. So what he has decided is that he is actually going to use his right, his own driveway, and create a driveway from it that allows to go to his property. So this easement across his land is the right of the owner of B to use A's property to get to B's house. That is by definition of easement. It's the right of another person to use your property for some specific reason. In this particular case, what has going on is there are two properties that are actually sharing some of the land. All right? So the fact that B is taking the right of A's land, that makes B the dominant party. All right? The dominant party or the dominant tenement. There's that word tenant again, meaning possession, not necessarily like in the lease. They are the dominant one because they are taking the use of A. That makes A the servant or the servient or the servant tenement. It is the one serving up or giving access to the dominant property. But wait, there's more. 